Okay, session nine, make sure you have the notes. Everyone has the notes. If you don't, they're back at the table. Let's go ahead and uh, pull session nine out and open your Bibles if you have a place to put it because we'll look at some other verses here there. Put your Bible. Okay, session nine. So everybody grab a seat real quick and let's jump right in. Session 9. Father, we come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Lord, again, we ask you to draw us after you. Draw us into communion with your heart and let us run together with you in partnership in the mandate that your Father gave you to disciple the nations. We say, draw us after you, Lord. We want to arise and run together after you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I ask you that in this session tonight, you would strengthen and encourage and illuminate our understanding. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, session nine, divine chastisement. Chapter three, verse one to five. By night on my bed, I sought the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. I will rise now, I said. I will go about the city, in the streets and in the squares. I will seek the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. The watchmen who go about the city found me. And I said, have you seen the one that I love? Scarcely had I passed by them when I found the one that I love. I held on to him. I would not let him go. Until I brought him to the house of my mother and to the chamber of her who conceived me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field. Do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. The overview of Song of Solomon chapter 3 verse 1 to 5. In this passage of scripture, Jesus hides his face from the young bride. In chapter 2, verse 8 to 17, our last session, the Lord challenged the bride to come out of the comfort zone. He beckoned her to join him on the mountaintops. Again, the mountaintops speak uh, subjectively. They're different to us in each season of our life. The mountaintops speak of the high place with the Lord. It's not only a high place, often it's a public place. It's a place of risk that draws us out of the place of isolation. It's a place where we relate to people and we relate to others in, the, in obedience to the Lord. It's a high place and it's a public place. It's a place of risk. It's out of the comfort zone. It's behind the wall. It's not under the bed, under the shade tree, behind the wall, but it's in the public place. Now, the mountain top, the high place of the Lord, is different for us in each season of our life. Typically, the Lord highlights one or two areas in our life. And it's the, the mountain is the place that the Holy Spirit is highlighting. He invited her to bridal partnership. In this invitation was an answer to her original prayer. Draw me after you and let us run. He said, okay, I'm now drawing you. I'm calling you out of the comfort zone to me to the high place. A couple sentences down, she experiences the chastisement of a loving father who pried her fingers off the very things that held her in bondage. His discipline was, re it was expressed by his removing, by removing his manifest presence from her. Then when she rose up in obedience, his presence returned. B, the father loves the young bride too much to allow her to come up short of being the glorious, mature bride of the Lord Jesus. He's not angry in this time of discipline, but rather he is jealous for her. There's a vast difference. I'm going to add, uh, the cost of obedience is high, but it's less than the cost of disobedience. We consider often how much it costs to obey the Lord in the flesh, but rarely do we consider how much it cost us not to obey the Lord, and it actually cost us more. 
And the arena of obedience, again, it's subjective. It's the areas, it's the very few areas that the Holy Spirit highlights in our life, which speaks of the mountaintops. Now, a lot of us uh, imagine that every area that is, that is short of the ideal of total perfection is the, is the area the Lord is dealing with in our life. And that's not possible because there's thousands of areas in our life that are less than what the Lord Jesus walked in. But typically what the Holy Spirit does is that he will focus in on literally one or two areas. And when we get a religious spirit functioning, we try to take on 15 areas at one time, and it creates tremendous confusion. But obedience is, again, it's related to the mountaintops. It's the high place of the Lord. It's a subjective place. And when we neglect or ignore this place the Lord is beckoning us to, the cost what it cost us in terms of missing out on the spiritual pleasures and the enjoyment of the fascination of Jesus is far greater than we imagine. Again, we need to put a lot of attention on the cost of non-discipleship, of what it cost us to disobey in terms of missing out on the pleasures of the romance of the gospel and the fascination in our relationship with Jesus. Page 2. When the Lord leaves understanding the tension. Hebrews 13, for the Lord himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so there's a tension on how can the Lord leave us if he promised he would never leave us. First, he never leaves us in terms of our salvation. Our salvation never comes to an end. He is with us forever and forever in terms of our our salvation being sure and effective. Secondly, he never leaves us in the sense of allowing a pressure or a difficulty so great that we cannot bear it. He's always attending to us in these areas. Look at C. The way in which the Scripture sets forth God leaving us is in terms of our ability to discern His manifest presence upon our hearts. We commonly refer to this dynamic when we say, I don't feel the Lord like I used to. That's what... We're talking about when we talk about the Lord leaving her. It's not in terms of his salvation or his leadership over her life, allowing her to enter into things too great for her to bear. But rather it's her ability to feel and discern the presence of the Lord. Necessary to the concept of experiencing the presence of the Lord is understanding the beholding of the Lord dimly in this age. These are important uh, 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 introductory principles because when the Lord hides His face, we have to understand what's taking place when the Lord hides His face in discipline. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12, the Apostle Paul said, Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. The Apostle Paul's use of the metaphor of a mirror is one that requires understanding of the ancient mirror. The ancient mirror was a piece of polished metal that only gave a dim reflection. It was not like a modern mirror that gives a clear reflection. In the age to come, we have a clear reflection. We see face to face. We see all things clearly. We have complete knowledge. We have deep revelation. The Apostle Paul taught that in this age, the age of faith, we see dimly as in a mirror, as in the ancient mirror of polished metal. We can barely see the reflection, but a little bit. In this age, we possess only a little bit of revelation, and that's God's strategic plan. That's God's wise plan for this age. Number one, the dim beholding of God in this age is a foundational principle that causes confusion to some of God's people. It's not biblical to teach that we have continual face-to-face knowledge of God right now. It's, it sounds exciting, but it's not realistic. In this age, we see dimly as in a mirror, as in an ancient mirror. It's called the age of faith. In the, age, in the eternal city, we see face-to-face. It's in the dim beholding that the Lord causes the feeling of His presence to be restrained in order to produce a certain response in her. That's where we're going. 
this is a pastoral concern because we're talking about the Lord revealing His face and hiding His face in this section, in this passage of Scripture. So that's why this fits. I'm addressing some common exaggerations related to experiencing the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> Most of us have read books that relate exaggerated spiritual experiences, or we've heard message sermons, or typically uh, we find it in books. I believe that many biographies exaggerate on the subject of communion with God. And I give a, a bit of my own experience of how I would read these stories in my early days of these men and women who allegedly had this face-to-face -face communion with the Lord. That's not biblical. Even Paul the Apostle saw dimly. I developed the, the pain and the the negative uh, result of exa spiritual exaggerations. Spiritual exaggerations make for a good meeting, but they are disastrous to people's experiences afterwards if they believe the exaggeration. Whether it's the meeting or a book. I, re I remember uh, uh, writing something one time, and the person that was helping me write uh, was writing my story in a, in a, in a lengthy context, and this uh, particular person that was helping me as a, in a ghostwriter capacity, uh, said to me, this person said, yeah, but I said, well, I want to say that I felt spiritually bored and disconnected and I was struggling. And the person said, yeah, but that's kind of negative. I said, well, it was really negative. It's true. It was really negative. And I said, yeah, but we want to put forth a positive example. I said, no, no, I want to put forth a true example. Because if people believe this, and it's a spiritual exaggeration. At the end of the day, what's going to happen, they're going to assume God loves Mike Bickle and all these other people, but doesn't love them. And they're going to feel they're the only one uniquely disqualified to experience God because they believe in all the spiritual exaggerations. Spiritual exaggerations I have under, in number two here under C, they condemn people. That's why it's so important to expose them. When we exaggerate our own spiritual experience beyond what's actually happening, it condemns the young and the naive who believe. Because it makes them reach for that which they cannot attain. And their logical conclusion is everybody else is attaining it. So they must be uniquely disqualified. It's a very, very disastrous thing. I experienced that. I, I have this uh, written in, in page four and five here. In my own experience. And I went through quite a, uh, quite a negative, uh, some real negative ex uh, experiences in the realm of spiritual exaggerations. Because I believe them. And then I sorted out that most biographies exaggerate. They don't mean to, but they do because the guy or the gal writing the biography typically is enamored with the subject of the biography. They're kind of their hero. That's why they're writing their biography. And they, they do no wrong. And they present it and they walked in and their face shone like an angel and God was always on them. And I read, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I felt boring and bored and distant and dull. And I thought, I must be the one person you don't like. And the Lord might have whispered and said, no, you're one of the many who believe the exaggerations and lies. And so that's been a, uh, an issue in my ministry for many years that I've been very, very adamant about is wanting to present a real, the real issue and not the, it's not even the ideal. It's just simply a spiritual exaggeration. It's not even the ideal because the ideals are things that God uh, are practical for us to reach for in this age. So I developed that a bit more. And some of you are suffering from the disease called spiritual exaggeration, and you might not know it. And you might be doing better with the Lord than you even think you are. A divine discipline rooted in divine affection. In times of divine discipline, God reveals His displeasure with a particular area of our life. Remember, the Holy Spirit's only highlighting one or two areas, typically at a time. I think of, of the, uh, the microscope uh, 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 illustration where in the science lab you looked at in the microscope and you see a, a certain uh, object on the glass there and then you turn it up 10 power, then 100 power, then 1,000 power. When you're looking at it at 10 power, you think it's pretty clean and everything's doing good and you turn it up to 100 power, there's all kinds of dirt. And the Holy Spirit at any given time in our lives could say there's so much more dirt than you have the ability to see. I'm only focusing in on that which is strategic and able for you, uh, uh, that, that you're able to respond to in this season. 
Throughout our entire journey, we're dark but lovely. Our entire journey on this side of eternity. There's always more areas in our heart of pollution that we're not in touch with. And yet we're lovely to the Lord in each stage. So divine discipline is not because an area is off. There's many areas that are off. It's the area the Holy Spirit's highlighting that He makes clear that we refuse. Some people live in the ambiguity of assuming there's all these areas that they can't figure out which is the area. It's, that's called a religious spirit. A religious spirit, one manifestation of it, is when we're, re, we're repenting in general without a Holy Spirit-specific conviction. It looks noble, but in the end it throws us into a spiritual tailspin. I repent, I repent, I repent. I'm creepy, I'm bad. Well, what exactly are you repenting of the Holy Spirit's put his finger on? I don't know, I just repent. That sounds noble, but it throws you into just spiritual confusion. I want to repent specifically related to conviction of the Holy Spirit. And again, the Lord typically, only, I only have the capacity to be challenged in a couple areas because my mind's so small, like yours. The Holy Spirit knows so much about what I need to change. And He knows I can only take so little at one time. So divine discipline is related to a specific area. Not just the general hodgepodge of I'm short of the perfection of Jesus. Well, of course. Again, I, I, I've gone to meetings where let's just call them to repent. And I've seen people go up because they, they don't want to miss out with God and they're just crying at the old repenting, but there's no Holy Spirit conviction. And again, in the end, that it, it seems noble, but it, it's a bit, throws us into spiritual confusion and we end up unsure where we are with the Lord. And I believe the Holy Spirit has very specific seasons and He does not want those seasons disrupted by people with a religious spirit trying to put conviction on you that God's not putting on you in that season. And that's why three times in the book, the, Lord, the Holy Spirit's saying, don't disturb her right now. I have her right where I want her. And a, a well-meaning person might say, yeah, but look, and there's an area that's wrong. And he says, oh, there's many areas that are wrong, but that's the one I'm working on her specifically right now with these two or three areas. Leave her alone. Don't confuse her right now. A, in times of discipline, the Lord reveals His displeasure with an area. This is not the same thing as God's displeasure with us as a person. God can be displeased with, an, with a certain behavior without despising us as a person. He disciplines us and yet has deep affection and enjoyment of us as He's disciplining us. Some people mistake divine correction for divine rejection. But the Lord's chastisement is rooted in His affection. When somebody corrects us, then we feel they reject us. But the Lord is very different because in the human arena, it's typically true. In the human arena, when somebody corrects you, often they are rejecting you. But with the Lord, it's vastly different. I'm talking about uh, divine uh, uh, chastisement and the holiness of God is the subject. The holiness of God has several, many dimensions to it. That's what I should have said. God's holiness is more than His hatred of sinful things. Most of us have understood God's holiness to focus on His hatred of wrong things. But the word holy is derived from a word that is often used to convey the idea of separation, distinction, or uniqueness. God's holiness speaks of something unique and totally different from everything else that, that we know. The word holiness means separated from, distinct from, or unique. Fundamental to the word holy is the idea of being, of being totally other than. God is totally other than in the way He feels towards sinful people. One of the greatest... Uh, uh, one of the, the greatest dimensions of his holiness, of his unique other thanness, is the other than way he feels about weak people. He is so unique in the passion he has for broken people, and in that's one of the greatest dimensions of his holiness, his unique other thanness. It says here in Isaiah 55 Let the wicked forsake his way, let him return to the Lord, God will have mercy on him, and he will abundantly pardon. Why? Because my thoughts aren't your thoughts, my ways aren't your ways. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts, your thoughts. God's superior thinking 
And God's superior ways of dealing, ways are the ways he deals with people, and his thoughts are the ways that, that, that he views people. His ways are, are, describes how he relates to them, the circumstances, the way that he leads and deals with them. God says, I think about them and I relate to them and deal to them different than any other human being, anyone on the earth. Matter of fact, I'm so superior, I'm so distinct in my capacity for mercy that it's called holy. Typically, we read this passage in context to, often we'll read it in context to uh, wisdom, but this passage is in context to God's capacity to think and to treat people who are sinful in mercy in a vastly unique and superior way than any human being can. That's the context of Isaiah 55. He's talking about giving mercy to wicked people. He says, as high as the heavens are of the earth, I am so other than any of you, there's no model on the earth to understand how I feel towards the wicked who cry out for mercy. Beloved, this is a good deal. The God that runs the universe is absolutely lovesick for human beings. This is good. Smile. This is really good. He's governing all things. He's administrating all of history. He is the judge at the end of history, and he's totally other than in the way that he feels towards wicked people who repent. The kindest man or woman on the earth can't begin to compare James Dobson's ideal father is so vastly inferior to God the Father's passion for weak and broken children. There is no man on the earth. It, it's not even, it's not remote. It's as high as the heavens are above the earth in God's capacity to feel for the weak and broken. It's a very, very significant verse to understand. God's manifest presence is withdrawn. Now we're going to actually look at the five verses now, the verse, line by line, right through the uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. The young bride experiences divine discipline, but I lay, I've laid the context. The divine discipline does not mean he's angry with her. It means he's going to pry her fingers off of the things that will destroy her. By night on my bed, I sought the one I lo love. I sought him, but I did not find him. This is a new experience for her, to seek him without finding him, because all through chapter one and two, when she sought him, she found him. She was, remember chapter two, verse three. Uh, uh, under his shade is great delight. At his table is bent over me as love. Feed me, sustain me, chapter two, verse five. Oh, she's absolutely lovesick in chapter two, verse five. But now she seeks him, but she does not find him. It's a brand new experience. She was disobedient to the Lord in, very, in a very specific issue that is, uh, that is symbolized by the mountain, the high place that the Lord is calling her to in that season of her life. Again, the, the mountain is different. The high place of the Lord is different for each one of us in each season of our life. But she refused to rise up. She stays behind the wall of isolation. She continues on her bed, under the shade tree, eating grapes and raisin cakes. <laughs> she was called to leave the comfort zone and go with him on the high place which happened to be a public place as well it's the place where there's risk of interacting with people where all of the of the potential and the reality of rejection and misunderstanding and being used and abused all the the things that go along with the public ministry public doesn't necessarily mean platform ministry i don't mean on a platform public means the interaction with people in the corporate life of the body the nighttime of spiritual life. Consider the four nights of spiritual life here. By night on my bed I sought the one I love. Night is the opposite of day. And I describe the moral night, which speaks of the time of moral failure. She needs to run to God in failure instead of from God in the night. In the night we're supposed to seek Him. In the night of moral failure. There's the night, uh, there's the super, there's the uh, circumstantial night. King David's being chased by Saul from cave to cave. Joseph's in the dungeon. It's the night time. Instead of giving up and concluding the Lord's, his words are false, David sought the Lord and so did, so did Joseph in the night. So there's the circumstantial night. There's the literal, the physical night, which speaks of Burning the midnight oil and prayer and loving meditation upon the word. It's talking about this desperation that even causes us to step over our physical boundary lines. We stay up late, though there's a weariness that's going to happen. It's that, 
It's what prayer and fasting and, and the watch of the Lord will draw us into the physical night where even our limitations are taxed. Of course, you can only do that uh, occasionally. You can't do that seven days a week, 24 hours a day. But there's those, there are those uh, 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 times in the grace of God where we reach beyond the normal limitations. It's what fasting and prayer, law, uh, night vigils are about, those kind of things. And then there's the spiritual night, of which chapter, uh, Song of Solomon chapter 5, verse 6 is the classic. It's when she can't feel the Lord's presence at all. She can't feel Him spiritually. The point is, is that in the night she seeks Him. Regardless which night we're talking with, in the night she, she refuses to quit and to give up and to lose her vision to be a lover of God. In the night, regardless what night, she seeks. The young bride seeks the Lord without obedience, though, without specific obedience to a specific challenge to the mountains. By night, on my bed, I sought the Lord, the one I love. It's her bed as contrast to their bed. Chapter 1, verse 16. She goes, I'm on my bed. He says, no, it's our couch. It's our bed. It's our palaquin. is what we're going to look at later. It's our chariot. But she's on her own now. She, there's been a breach in the relationship. She's on her bed, and that's a negative. Because she's supposed to be leaving to go with the Lord on the mountains. And so she's not supposed to be there right then. That's the point of disobedience in, this, uh, in the picture language of the story. The bride's sincere heart of love for Jesus. By night on my bed I sought the one I love. I love this. She's sincere in her love. Just as she proclaimed two verses earlier. She said, I am my beloved's and he is mine. Just two verses earlier. I love him. He loves me. She never loses. She never loses her spiritual identity as a lover of God. Even in her spiritual difficulty. She is not a hopeless hypocrite. Because she's compromising. We struggle with the mountain issue that the Lord calls us to, the high place. Whatever the mountain is the Lord beckons you to in every season of your life, we struggle with it typically by definition. The fact it's a high place causes us to struggle. We, we, we cough and we kind of uh, you know, <coughs> choke a little bit because the, not, the, the, the mountain place is the place of challenge. It's the place out of the comfort zone regardless what it is. Typically, for a season, we struggle, and it's in that season that we are still lovers of God. We're not hopeless hypocrites because we struggle. It's called weak flesh. Somebody might come to her and say, you're not, you're not pressing in. You're not taking that mountain. And she could have said, I will eventually. I'm not now. Wow, you're just a sinner. Yes, I am dark of heart, but I am lovely to the Lord. I'm a lover. Of, I love him. I don't lose the testimony that I'm a genuine lover of God because I'm encountering my weak flesh before the challenge of the mountain. Every season of my life, there's a mountain that's out of my reach. That's why it's a mountain. It's a challenge. It's out of the thing that I'm comfortable with. And a mountain this year, two or three years from now, will be something that I'm comfortable in the grace of God with. The Lord will show me another mountain. And I've learned over the years that in between mountaintops, when I'm in the valley, in between the mountains, I'm still a lover of God. And I see myself as a disciple who loves the Lord. I'm not, I'm not a hopeless hypocrite because I'm, I have weak flesh. And neither are you and neither is she. She says, it's the one that I love. I'm a lover of God and I'm a lover, I'm a lover of Jesus. I'm a lover of God specifically. That's who I am. This is a statement of identity. By night, on my bed, I still love him. You hopeless hypocrite, what are you doing on the bed at the night time? I'm still a lover of God. The young bride seeks, earnestly seeks the Lord. By night on my bed, I sought the one. I love that. She's engaged. She says again, I sought him two times in verse 1. I sought the one I love. I sought him. She's seeking the Lord. She hasn't given up because many people, because they have a wrong idea of who God is and how he feels when he's correcting and disciplining us, and they have a wrong view of themselves. They see themselves as a hopeless hypocrite instead of a lover of God. They, refuse, they give up on their vision to be a lover of God. They let go of the seeking. They let go of the vision to make the first commandment first. She doesn't. She goes, I sought him. I sought him. I'm still pursuing. I'm going hard after him. I love this. There's a verse in uh, 
Judges 8, I believe it's verse 3 or 4, it says, faint yet pursuing. I love that phrase. I remember I preached on that many years ago. Faint yet pursuing. Here she is. She goes, I'm struggling. It's the nighttime. I don't feel him, but I'm pursuing. I'm faint, but I'm still pursuing. She is using, number one, all the proven spiritual principles from her past in order to find him, but they're not working. It's easy for us to give up in the dark times. He wants us to rise up, not give up. The whole point of the night discipline is so that she would rise up. There are so many dynamics happening in the night that are God-ordained. And I have them listed several times uh, in session 9 and session 10. I have uh, several different places. We'll probably... uh, uh, just pass over them, but uh, uh, describing some of the dynamics that take place in the nighttime of our spiritual life. She continues in the posture of seeking God through the familiar spiritual disciplines, prayer, meditation, the way that she described back when she said, sustain me, refresh me, but they're not working because the Lord has his finger on a specific area, the mountaintop, the high place he's challenging her in is the area she's not yielding in. And he's not angry, but he says, you will enjoy me and I will ex- we will experience intimacy in a greater way in the mountaintop in this area. So I'm not going to let go until you rise up. I'm not going to release you from this season of divine discipline till you, till you say yes to me because your fascination, your spiritual passion, your dignity, your destiny are wrapped up in being with me on the mountain. You're my bride. Jesus holds his presence from her. By night on my bed I sought him, but I did not find him. What a brand new experience. Spiritual disciplines are no substitute for obedience in the area the Holy Spirit's dealing with in our life. Spiritual disciplines did not solve her problem. Yesterday's disciplines that helped us experience the presence of the Lord with today's challenge of the Holy Spirit neglected and ignored will not bring us into the enjoyment of the fascination of Jesus. It's the very Jesus that loves us that says, I'm going to woo you out of the place of isolation. The, the place of fear is really what it is. It's not isola- it's isolation in this case, but it's the place of fear. I'm going to get you out of the comfort zone of the mountaintop. The benefits of seasons of divine withholding. I have a... Uh, seven uh, short, small paragraphs in the next page or two. You can read those on your own. Just some, some things that are happening in these night times in the Spirit. I should uh, add here, I'll call it the Jeremiah 20, verse 7 principle. In Jeremiah 20, verse 7, uh, Jeremiah says, I'm using the, uh, new, the New American Standard. It says, The Lord has deceived me, and I was deceived. And what is taking place is that Jeremiah, in his youth, the the Lord came and revealed the beauty of the Lord and wooed him and romanced his heart. He fell totally in love with the Lord. The Lord says, good, I have you hooked up. I have you completely fascinated with me, where I am your superior pleasure. I am the source that you live by. Now I have a mission for you. But it's a very difficult mission. In the language of Song of Solomon, it's, the, it's a mountaintop issue. It's a, it's a high place in the Lord. It's a challenge. He was to rebuke the governmental leaders, the political and religious leaders, which were synonymous of Israel, and they threw him in a prison and tortured him. They literally tortured him in the prison. So he's down in the pit, and in, in, it's a very, very difficult uh, uh, place where he's at. He says, okay, I'm going to quit. This is, this is absolutely destroying my life. He says, uh, I'm in the pit. And I said, I'm not going to speak anymore. And he says, then it burned like fire on the inside of me. He goes, God, I can't live without you. You tricked me. You made me love you. And now I'm so connected to you, I can't walk away from you. I call it the Jeremiah principle. <laughs> Chapter 1 and 2, he's connecting the bride to the, to the spiritual pleasures, the romance of the gospel. Her whole inner life is connected in the pleasures of God. And now when those pleasures are lifted, the Lord can lead her anywhere because she is so, she is so uh, 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 hungry for communion with God. She goes, I'm not going on the mountains. The Lord says, okay, I'll just lift the, 
the sense of my intimacy. And she goes, oh, I hate it. I can't take it. He goes, okay, well, then get up. Come on, I love you. Don't you see what I do? I love you. You put that to Jeremiah 20, verse 7 principle. Just throw that one in extra. The young bride adds obedience to her prayers. Again, it's a specific obedience. It's not just hodgepodge obedience. And what I mean by that, there's no such thing as that. But, you know, read the latest biography, whatever they did, now you will do. That, that is, doesn't really get us anywhere except for into confusion. God wants his individual people to learn to think and understand and follow their own way with the Lord. Their tailor-made journey. People come to me uh, here and there and they say, what do you do about, how do you prepare messages, how, do you, how much do you pray and fast, how much do you give, how much do you do A, B, C, D, E? Because they, they're not trying to be personal, they're trying to find a model for their own life to follow. And certainly 99% of the time, rarely ever do I ever give an answer. I say, it really doesn't matter. They go, oh, no, no, really just tell me. I go, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I like you too much and I understand the dynamics. Because you're going to go try to do what I do and it's not going to work for you because it's not what God's calling you to in this season, so I'm not going to tell you. Because it won't work for you. Because what I do, I have grace to do. And what I do now, I, didn't, I couldn't do five years ago. And what I do in five years from now, I can do now. So it's specific obedience. The principle is that she's adding that obedience. She will arise and go. I will rise now. I will go about the city and the streets and the squares. I will seek the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. I will arise now and I will go. There she is. Remember back in chapter uh, number one here, he said, arise and come. In chapter two, verse 10 and 13, she said no in verse 17. Now she says yes. She goes, okay, I will arise. I can't live without you. I can't live without this communion. I can't live without the deeper life increasing. I can't even live with what I had yesterday. It has to increase in order to satisfy her. A lovesick person has to grow in intimacy and love in order for the love to satisfy. There's a a principle I'll just add it here. The only way that we can keep ground with the Lord is to take new ground. The only way I can maintain what I'm experiencing in a positive sense in the Lord today is by taking new ground. When I cease to take new ground, I don't mean for a day or a week, but in a season of my life, when I cease to take new ground, I lose the ground I have now. There is no such place as a static place in the spirit where you get there, then you unplug and stay there for a while. The only way you can keep the ground you have, the only way you can keep the romance you're experiencing now in the Lord is by, is by experiencing more. You will never ever stay exactly where you are now. You're either going forward or you're going backward. And the only way that I can increase, no, the only way I can maintain is by increasing. And that's what's going on here. Oh, I, I trust that, 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 that you get that point. Some people have a real powerful season of the Lord, a, a real season of divine romance. They feel the Lord and they love the Lord. And they're at the very beginning of the beginning. They don't even hardly know that. At any season of their life, we're still at the beginning of the beginning. Paul is still at the beginning of the beginning in some ways. Compared to what the Lord Jesus walked in with his Father. We're just all at the beginning. We all see dimly. And they have this season, they love it, and then they get negligent, and they think, well, I've, I, I have attained this experience in the Lord, this place of ex- relationship, it will be there. No, it doesn't work that way. That will be gone. That will be gone in a number of months if you don't take more ground. The heart of a lover has to take more ground to keep the ground they have. I just want to stress that. The young bride enters into the corporate life of the body. I will arise. I will go about the city. The city speaks of the corporate life, and I have it laid out there a bit. The place of risk outside of the comfortable wall in the bed. I will arise, go about the city in the streets and in the squares. The streets is the place of action. The streets is the place of danger. The streets is the place of encountering Jesus as well. Out in the streets and in the squares where all the public activity is going, that's where the danger is, that's where the action is, and that's where she's going to meet the Lord because that's what the Lord wants her, that's where he wants her in that season. 
It says in Matthew 25, verse 41, when you did it to the least of them, you did it to me. You touched me when you touched them. Jesus, he has, again, he has seasons for us at all, uh, at all different times, but in this season of her life, he wanted her in the streets. He doesn't want you in the streets literally in every season of your life. He wants you in the place that he's ordained for you for that season. But it's a place of risk because it's in the streets where the negative can happen. Okay, I'm going to fulfill the mandate. I'm going to say yes to the public, the corporate dimension of the gospel. Again, I'm not talking about platform ministry per se. I'm talking about I'm going to do the risk of now ministering to others. And when you touch broken, sinful people, they bite you. Not every time, but plenty of times they will. There isn't a man or woman in the body of Christ who consistently ministers that does not get rejected, corrected, and rejected by the people they minister to. It's how it works. And the Lord meets us in that place. And she is saying, I don't want to go there. It's dangerous. And the Lord says, but you will meet me and you will find me in deep places in the place of risk. She perseveres in seeking Jesus in the night season. Oh, I love this. I, in the streets and in the squares, I will seek the one I love. I sought him. Here she's, she's repeating it twice like she did in verse 1. Four times she says, I will seek him. I will seek him. I will seek him. Four times in two verses, I will seek him. I will seek him. I will seek him. This, she's this faint but pursuing, this relentless seeking, this relentless desire to take new ground even when she's in the night time in the spirit. She has the vision to go forward. Faint yet pursuing. I, I mentioned earlier from Judges 8. She continues to seek him regardless of the immediate results. Look at this. She says, I am seeking him. This is the kind of intensity that God desires and then richly rewards. I have to say, God pays so well. God pays so well when he rewards us. Some folks say, again, there's four times. She says in two verses, I sought the Lord. They we, we, our seeking is so faint, our seeking is so casual, our seeking is so unpurposeful. Well, we'll read our Bible for a half hour a day for three weeks in a row for four days a week. And if it doesn't change all by them, no, no, no. At least lock into a 10-year commitment on the front end. No, I'm, I'm really serious. People come to me and they go, I don't know where to begin. I go, I know exactly where to begin. Just begin on page one, you know, just start Matthew 1, open and start reading it. I said, the Holy Spirit will lead you where to go. Don't worry about that. You just start. Well, I've done it for a few months. I go, no, don't even think about reevaluating it to the 10-year mark. 10-year, I was thinking of a three-year instant return. I go, no, no, don't even. You have taken so many years to pollute your mind, you're not going to be renewed in your mind and your emotions in three months. Just set your dial on a 10-year commitment and then complain at the 10-year mark if nothing's happening. I'm really serious. Get, get the, uh, 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 this weak purposeless, easily distracted kind of mode of seeking. Well, I'll do a little bit. She is seeking the one, even in the nighttime. She is seeking him. She does not immediately find him. Here she's, she's risen, like he said. She's in the city, in the streets, in the squares. But in, in the streets, in the squares, I seek him. I saw him, but I didn't find him. She goes, it didn't happen immediately. He says, you keep seeking me. I'm doing things. I'm drawing things out of you. Back in chapter 1, verse 8, he says, by the shepherd's tents, that's where I will feed you. She's done everything except for the shepherd's tent part. And so she has to interact with the watchman before she finds the Lord. And that's a very dynamic principle. A right spirit towards spiritual authority. Again, the problem with spiritual authority is they're all weak, broken people. But the Lord has a design to trans. To transform us in the context, in perfect leadership, but he has a, he has an order in his body, a divine order, spiritual authority. It's a very, very essential reality in the body of Christ. Again, uh, you know, throughout history, the spiritual authorities have, have, uh, in the body of Christ have abused their authorities, their, their position of authority. That's not my subject right now. It's the place that Jesus wants a church in order under his government, and he wants to feed us in context to the shepherd's tents. I don't have time to develop that, but I just wanted to mention that. The bride requests help from these shepherds. I sought him, but I didn't find him. But the watchmen who go about the city found me, and to, the, to whom I said, I said to them, have you seen the one I love? She humbles herself, which speaks of her right attitude to spiritual authority. 
She humbles herself to them and asks for their help. But I like, uh, she wants leaders that have deep reality. She says, have you seen the one I love? She goes, I want to, uh, I want to interact. You don't, everyone doesn't have this option. She goes, I want to interact with watchmen who, who've seen the Lord. And I don't necessarily mean an open vision. I have here a voice or an echo. God wants a number of you are sitting in this room right now to be watchmen in the city. Men and women is in positions of leadership. And God is raised, he's telling the body of Christ, I will only feed my body the deepest things in context to the shepherd's tents, in context to the whole body. I don't want them, I don't want them in a bad spirit towards my divine purpose on the earth. I'm building a church and I have authority in it. And God is raising up many of you not only to be uh, those that will function in authority in a right way, but you will be watchmen who have seen the Lord, you have revelation of Jesus. You're, you're experiencing the deep things of the Lord. You've seen Him. There's this new hunger that's breaking out across the land where the body of Christ is, is just regurgitating the sweetness of the diet of the last 10 or 20 years. This consumer, self-centered meism Christianity doesn't touch the deep place of our spirit. And so many of God's leaders have uh, have succumbed to ear tickling, where we end up just telling people what they want to hear. But the problem is, it bores them. It bores them, and they lose their ability to be fascinated in the Lord without wholeheartedness. God is raising up watchmen who have seen the Lord, who are in the divine romance, who are abandoned to the Lord, 100%. And you are some of those watchmen, and the Lord's telling those that are coming after you, I want them to be rightly related to spiritual authorities. Be a spiritual authority that has seen the Lord, that has a history in God in their private life. She consistently consistently emphasizes loving Jesus. She goes, I did not find him, but have you seen the one I love? I believe she says that five times in these verses. Five times, the one I love, the one I love. She will not let go of the focus of being a lover, nor the identity of being a lover. It's all about love to her. Seeking is about love. Seeking is not mostly about getting an anointing so she can be rich and famous in the ministry. It's about love. It's it's five times. The one I love, the one I love, I'm seeking. I'm relentless. I don't care if it's the dark night. I don't care how difficult. I want him. I want him. I love him. I love him. I love him. It's about love that her tenacity is seeking. It's not about just getting an anointing to establish her ministry in the sight of people. It's a love affair. She's in the bridal paradigm. She's lost in, a, in, a, in, a, in the unfolding of a romance. It's about her and the lover of her soul. We need about a, a million leaders in the body of Christ worldwide who are tenaciously seeking the first commandment first. And God is raising them up, by the way, cr- across the world right now. He's really stirring up people to be abandoned lovers of the Lord all over the nations. And he is going to do this as a gift to the body of Christ It's going to raise up multitudes of men and women who are lovers of God first. And my prayer is that many of you in this room, all of you, would be a part of that. His presence returns in response to her obedience. I found him. (laughs) The Lord renews his presence. I found him. Response to her specific obedience and to her persistence to seek God in the night. Oh, I found him. Uh, G- uh, uh, number two, Genesis 32, Jacob was in trouble in a night season in his life. Some of you know the context of Genesis 32. He's pictured as wrestling. He's alone in the night. He's facing his fears. He's anticipating the danger of his enemy. He's wrestling with God and he's prevailing. And I'm going to... Uh, uh, skip some of this, but it, it's, it's the importance of wrestling until we find the one. It's prevailing prayer. I want to press in until. The divine principle of spiritual hunger cries out, if we can live without something in God, then often we will go without it. However, if there's something in the Word of God we can't live without then we're going to receive it in due time. That's, that, that's a, a rule of prevailing wrestling with the Lord. I'm going to seek Him until I find Him and hold on to Him. If there's something in the Lord you can live without, then you'll probably go without it. There's lots of God's people say, I don't really need any heartwarming revelation of the beauty of Jesus. And then 
I believe that the Holy Spirit's answer is, well, well then you, you, can, you can live without that. You can do that. But if you can't live without it, the Holy Spirit says, I'll give it to you. And there's many of you in this room, you're saying, I, I can't live without uh, experiencing this fascination with you. I have to be a part of this. I have to take ground. I have to start this journey. And the Lord's saying, if, if you're serious that you can't live without it, I'll give it to you little by little. For example, it's the privilege of every believer to have a heart tenderized by the Word of God. Well, then put your heart in the way of the Lord by prayer and fasting. You don't have to live bored. You do not have to live spiritually bored. I refuse to allow this reality unspoken to settle in on the people of God in this place that it's, it's our lot to live spiritually bored. Well, you know, I was always kind of a slow learner and I got real mistreated when I was young and I never really did, never was on the inside of anything. I'll probably just live spiritually bored. I go, that's a lie. You don't have to live spiritually bored if you don't want to. It's not about how good your capacities are. It's about your spirit being built by God and it's acclimated to God when we give ourselves to Him. And the Holy Spirit will draw you to Him. Hey Lord, we want your presence. We want our heart tenderized. We want the Word of God alive. We want the spirit of prayer. I want to feel the unction of God on me when I pray, in private and in public. But I want the spirit of prayer on me. I said this many, many years ago. I said, Lord, I'm not going to live without a spirit of prayer on me. I read it in a book, uh, Man said that the spirit of prayer, when it lifted off of me, I would retreat in the wilderness. Charles Finney said this. I remember I was about 22 years old. He said, I'd retreat in the wilderness for a couple of days of prayer and fasting till the spirit of prayer returned back on me. I remember as a young 22-year-old, 23, I said, what is that? He would go pray and fast. Till I said, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to get it. Then I began to understand what that means. And, what, and I'm not going to live without a spirit of prayer in my heart. I might have seasons where, where it, it's, it's lifted, but I'm not content to live like that. I'm going to feel the power and the unction of God in my private life. I'll say it again. You don't have to live bored. Because your friends say they do, and they call everything else legalism, because we're pressing into the Lord. That's a lie. I don't, ha I don't buy any of that stuff. I go, you can live bored and have your, your, your false doctrine of the grace of God. I'm going to live romanced and lovesick and on fire, and I'm going to be in pursuit until I experience it more and more. We don't have to live bored. Just close your eyes right now and just ask the Holy Spirit to settle this in your spirit in a deep way. Say, I'm going to have the spirit of prayer, Lord. I'm going to have a tenderized heart. I'm going to be fascinated with Jesus. I don't mean every minute of every day. I'm going to go on the way of the Lord. The Holy Spirit, I ask you to put your hands on these people right now. I ask that you to establish in these people a vision, of the romance of the gospel, that they can be different, they can bring something different to multitudes in their lifetime. The Holy Spirit, just come and rest on us now. Lord's calling you to the mountains now, the mountaintops. He's calling you to the high place in the Lord. He's probably there's an area or two. Often it's just the way we squander our time. That's the mountain place to many people. Draw me closer. We just squander our time, hours and hours a week and a month. Draw me closer. The romance of the ages is waiting for people. Who will say, I will seek you until I find you and hold on to you. So that I might touch you. So that I might touch you. Lord, I want to touch you. Touch my eyes. Oh, oh we want to touch you, Lord. Inch 
by inch. Month by month, year by year. I'm not talking about everything changing in one week or one month. I'm talking about a long-term vision. I'm talking about a marathon pace. Ten years is your first is your first leg of the race. Ten years I'll do this before I complain. Before I conclude it doesn't work. The love of the body of Christ is waiting for multitudes of men and women like you who will bring them something. Watchmen who have seen the Lord in their personal lives. Talking about a heart tender in the word is what I mean by that. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.